today I want to go through the basic um, flow of um, setting up SPAT to work with a speaker system. So let's say you walk into a studio like this one, and you want to move some sounds around. So first thing I want to do, so I'm going to go through um, uh, plugging in the speaker coordinates, testing the channels, then we'll um, go and um, uh, do some panning. And then if you remember from the, the end of last time, we noticed that the um, distance encoding was not happening with spat pan, right? So um, today we'll look at that and then go through uh, spat opera and look at um, what the different parameters in spat opera are doing and how they um, shape the feeling of, or, or how they, they affect the virtual source's uh, interaction with the space. Generally, when you, when you have a speaker set up, first thing you need to do is figure out where the speakers are. Um, lucky for us, um, the guys here on the team already calculated that for us. But if you, know, if you have your own system and you have it in a room, basically you want to know the relationship of the speakers to the sweet spot in the middle of the room. Um, most surround systems are sweet spot systems. So that means there's a center point where is quote unquote the best um, listening position. So generally, zero, that's the zero, zero, zero XYZ point in, the, in your space. Um, another way to think about it, um, let's look at a SPAT viewer. Let's just start thinking about it. Oops. So here's our space that we were looking at. Um, so we have left, right, front, back, top, down. And you know, perceptually, I, I mean, at least personally, I, I usually experience location in kind of polar coordinates, so the angle of something from me, rather than saying that something is at x, y, z position, it's usually that it's at some angle from me, at some height, at some distance. So generally, when, when thinking about perceptual values rather than um, coordinates, per se, uh, I would tend to go for polar uh, coordinates, so azimuth, elevation, and distance. So if you were thinking about, um, you know, if you wanted to do, if you had a circular array, we could plop down some speakers. Um, this is kind of review from yesterday. Um, actually, let me pull up that patch from yesterday. I'm just going to copy that. OK. So for instance, here, here is a set of speakers. Um, I've just noticed that I think you have to put the number of speakers in the bundle, if there seems to be a, a dependency in SPAT where actually the number of speakers might need to be set before the, the speaker coordinates, which is I think will get fixed eventually. Ideally, it doesn't matter because everything is synchronized together. Right, yeah. But I think at the moment, that's, that's the way it's, it is. Um, so if I click this, click, now it's put in some speakers and one, one source, so the speakers here have been set in their azimuth. If I change one of these to, let's say, negative 15, you'll see now that speaker 1 is very close to speaker 2. So if you, if you just have a, if you have a roughly spherical, I'm oh, sorry, a roughly circular array, you can kind of ballpark it like this. Or um, here's the example we were looking at yesterday with um, putting in the xy coordinates. And here is a, a, a square where we've set the x and y values individually like this. 
Now, if we bang spat fewer, it sends out the same information, but in a list format. Um, I'm going to send a message to spat viewer saying format XYZ. And then click this. And now the output is in XYZ. Um, Sorry, what mm -hmm. does format message do? Format uh, sets the output format. So rather than being. Um, uh, no, rather than being polar coordinates, so AED stands for azimuth elevation distance. Uh -huh. uh. Oh. Did I spell something wrong there? That's weird. So by D oh oh I had to bang I had to hit the bang, not this. So when you when you send a bundle in, it it output it doesn't output anything when you send this configuration bundle in. Um, but so here, you notice I put in speaker number and then XY, but it output speakers AED. So it's actually the same values, but just in a different format. So instead of being in two-dimensional Cartesian XY format, it's sending it out as a uh, three-dimensional uh, azimuth elevation distance. And if I want to change that, I can send a format message, and then it changes the format that it outputs. So now, after I clicked the format and then hit bang, now it sends out the speakers as X, Y, Z. And so this is a list of values, and the ordering is X, Y, Z for speaker one, X, Y, Z for speaker two, X, Y, Z for speaker three. So they're triplets of numbers. Um, Just to confirm, the Cartesian coordinates are in meters. Yeah. General, yeah, yeah. This one? Mm -hmm. Oh, and see the output? So now, so previously it was set to the, the square. So now it's back to the circle. So that this one here that we set in the azimuth values is a circle because we're just setting the angle. We're not setting the elevation or the distance. And so SPAT assumes that the distance is one for everything. Um, and the elevation is zero when you send in just the azimuth value. So eventually, you, you get a list. And let's see, I have somewhere here. So here's a list that, that Jeff sent me for the speaker coordinates in this room. So each, each speaker here is on a line. And the format is uh, azimuth, elevation, and distance. And this is common. This is like if somebody were to send you the coordinates, probably it would be something like this. They've just typed it out in somewhere, and it's a list. OK, so let's say you get a, you get a list like this. This is convenient because it's, it's, a list, it's a list of triplets, right? And so we know that SPAT can also take a list of, of triplets of values. And so what we can do is copy this list and go into our patch. And send it into SPAT Viewer. Now, first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to make a regular max object and paste this list into here. Now, ODOT is great for many things, but sometimes it's just more practical to, to um, store something in a, um, in a regular max list. The reason being that in ODOT, um, lists have commas separating them. So if I wanted to put this into ODOT, I'd have to go through and add a comma between each thing. Now, that's, that's pretty annoying. So <laughs> I'm too lazy to do that. And so what I do is I put it in a message object. And then I'll use ODOT pack to make a list. I'll make ODOT will add the commas for me. So here I'm going to say speakers. That means that it's a list. 
and the format is AED. And now if we copy an o.compose object and put this into the right inlet, click. We don't have that list, right? You don't have this list, no. <laughs> sure, but uh, it doesn't really, I mean, I'm, it's just for this, happens to be for this room. But, you know, just, you could make up some coordinates too if you want. I mean, it doesn't have to be AED also. Like we could take this example that we were looking at a second ago. Um, so let's say it's this one here. So this would be negative 45, 0, 45, 90, 135, 180, negative 135, negative 90. That's this, sorry. Ah. That's this example we were just looking at a second ago. And so I just typed that in manually there. And now that is just azimuth. So I just changed that to AZ for azimuth. And then if I click that, it does the same thing with just the same format that we were doing there. And I believe SPAT will not really like, so we're, there's notice that there's no, um, no speaker number value here. So my guess is that SPAT is not going to know how many speakers to, to play, and it doesn't. It, see, it doesn't do anything. It's saying, it's saying invalid number of positions because it doesn't really know. It's, it's, I don't like that error message because it should say there's no, it should say there, there is a zero number of speakers. So what we need to do then is add the number of speakers. Um, so there's several ways to do this. Um, my preferred method, and here's, I'm going to show a new object. This one is your new most favorite object called o.expertcodebox. And I'm going to talk a lot about o.expertcodebox, hopefully, if there's time um, tomorrow. And maybe, maybe today. Here I am talking about it. Okay. So o.expertcodebox, let's go to the help patch, alt click. o.expertcodebox is a, um, a code box where you can type expressions in, so little equations, where the OSC addresses are variable names. So if you've ever used something like Super Collider, this is um, a kind of a way to have that kind of text-based functional programming in Max, which is really, really cool. And on the second tab here, uh, there's something called functions. And you can go through and look at all the different functions. Um, also, there's all these other tabs. And also in the extras menu, you installed the music and computing um, package. And down in that, there's a, a thing called o.expert overview, which is a collection of what I think are the most used uh, functions. So if you go through the, if you study these, these, these are my, the ones I'd suggest to start with. But anyway. What we want to do is add the number of speakers. So, I'm, so what the, the way o.expert code box works is it takes a bundle in, and you can run a, an expression, and it adds the values to the bundle and outputs everything together. So now I'm going to type in slash speaker slash number equals 8, because I think there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight numbers here. In this case, we're just sending in azimuth values. So these are not triplets like we were, were going to do in a minute with azimuth ele elevation distance. This is a list of just azimuths. And so now if I just connect these things, and let's look at the output. Sorry, the cables are. I'm just going to delete these. Okay. Okay. 
So here's a before and after. So before, this is what we sent in. Speakers, da 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 And here's what came out. The same thing plus the thing that we added in here. So we assigned a new OSC address speaker number and gave it a value of 8. Notice that in o.expert code box, we use the equals sign to assign values, whereas the state of the bundle in o.compose is notated with uh, colons. I apologize for that um, formatting thing. OK, so now, hopefully, it worked. So now if I close and reopen that, hopefully, yay, yep, OK. So that's great. So now we've, we have set some speaker coordinates, labeled it with o.pack, added a new OSC address to the bundle, and then sent it to Spat Viewer to put those speakers in place. So now if we go back to the um, list of coordinates, I'm going to copy this list again. And now paste that in here. And this list is AED, azimuth elevation distance. And the number of speakers is now 32. And we don't really need to look at that, so I'm just going to get rid of that. And now if we go in here, aha. So the problem is, I think, yeah. So the, uh, let me try that again, just for testing purposes. OK, so now there should be nothing in there. And now if I click this, it didn't work because the number of speakers was at the bottom of the bundle. And so I have to click it twice in order for it to work. And so now if I zoom out, I can see all of the speakers in this room. All right. And how do you make this Wayfield set? Wayfield set. Yeah. <laughs> because you, you, they, they have this one line here. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you were to, to define yeah, positions, right? it's just a matter of having the positions. Yeah. So if you had all the positions there and you sent it in, instead of being this, this shape, it would just be a line. So it's, you just need the coordinates yeah. and the speakers. <laughs> yeah. I'm understanding the process, though. I said it's going to be kind of a pain to calculate degrees on a speaker in a line away from a center point in the, in the room, right? So, so is there like a... Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> basically, you just say, you, just say um, you know, you have to pick some reference point. Yeah. So if you have some speakers, let's say you have a row of speakers, you... You can measure the room, but you have to have you have to say where's zero somewhere. Right. So that's why I would use X. I would definitely use X Y Z for. Well, um, in spat. So let's say, oh, actually, yeah, this is cool. I wanted to show this this object. Here's a here's a fun object. It's called spat five dot transform. And what SPAT5 transform does, let's go to the help patch, is it moves things. So here's, here's the after, and here's the before. I'm just in the help patch right now. So the, the top one is the, is the source information, and the one afterwards is the result. So now I'm just going to offset everything by some value. And now you can see it moves the whole set of speakers over. You're just dragging it? I'm just, I'm dragging this number right up here, right by my mouse. So notice that the listener position isn't moving. So what's important to, to know here is that 
the, I'm not sure, I believe if you put all the speakers off to the side and you try to run VBAP or some kind of panning, we can, I mean, we can actually try this because I actually am plugged into the speakers. So we can actually, don't have to just talk about it. Um, I believe that what's going to happen is that it's, it's going to move everything over from the listening's, the listener's perspective. So all the panning is from where that little person is there. Where, where that head is. And that head is zero, zero, zero. It's the center of the universe. Is it like up there? It's wherever, it's, it's in the middle of the room, basically. It's wherever you measure from as the zero point. Okay, sorry, that's, that's wrong, that's wrong. So yeah, so basically, if let's say you came into the room and you said, I'm just gonna take a, a measuring tape and I'm gonna start at that wall over there and you measured where all the speakers were and then, so you have these values but they're all starting from, they're all gonna be greater than zero, right? Because zero is the wall. So everything is, like here, you can see everything is off to the left. So if you do the panning, everything's always gonna be off to the left because the panners all expect zero, zero, zero to be in the middle. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can do all that. Well, we haven't talked about that, but but um, yeah, you can put in um, sort of graphical representations of the room and things like that. And in terms of reverb, which we will talk about in a minute, um, in general, generally speaking, SPAT is using perceptual parameters for describing space more than um, uh, a geometric approach. But you, there are tools for making um, shoebox models and things like that in which you would define the room um, size. So, but just to, so when you're measuring, so if you measure this way, you're now going to have to offset all of your values to be centered around the middle of the room. And so what you can do is say, what's my lowest number, what's my highest number, and then just scale everything to be like that. Or um, you could put it in SPAT transform and just kind of drag it around until it looks right. I would recommend doing it computationally. Or don't start by measuring on the side of the room. First pick where the center of the room is, mark a tape, piece of tape on the ground, um, and measure out from there. Or if you are a more clever person, you might have a laser, what do you guys use? You have like a laser measurement and, and a protractor kind of thing? Yeah, it's over there in the corner. Oh, really? A, a not expensive laser tape measure that has that elevation built in. Cool. And then, um, and then a $20 digital protractor from Home Depot gets it. Cool. So, yeah, I actually, I, I, I need to build one of these myself, so I'm going to check it out. Because I always just use a tape measure, which is probably not. not I've never, measure. I've actually never personally measured a 3D system. I've only ever measured by hand a 2D system. So I think once you get to 3D, laser pointers probably, a laser measure, what's it called? Later laser measuring tool is probably the way to go. Yeah, uh, once you have to measure, you know, yeah, 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 totally. So yeah, so you pick the middle of the room, you get one of these cool measuring devices and you write down all of the coordinates in a list, just like Jeff gave me, and then copy and paste into SPAT is what I would do. So these coordinates, let's go back to our SPAT viewer, you can see are all centered around zero, roughly. And we can see also that there are some speakers that are below the zero line. So that means that the zero Z axis is, I would imagine, roughly your, your head height when you're sitting in a chair. There are some speakers on the floor, and those are probably the ones that are are below the zero line. So this dark, or sorry, this thick white line here is the zero, zero in these different axes. So here is x, y, and x, z. 
Okay. So the next thing, so spat transform is, is kind of fun for doing stuff. I, I want to talk more about that later, too. About the angle of the speakers, you always assume that they're always pointing towards the back. Yeah. yeah, generally with, with this kind of surround system. We actually ignore the angle because we are assuming they're always pointing towards the lead. Yeah. OK, the next most important thing you do when you're setting up a new system is check the levels, or check, check that you have signal out of each speaker. So let's do that. And there's a handy thing you can do with the DAC object is send a set message so you can step through the uh, speakers. And check to make sure you're on the right output. Check that you don't have anything else on that's going to explode. That's very important. Oh, this? That's called um, gain tilde. OK, now I'm going to slowly, very gently, carefully increase the volume here. And it turns out the speaker is right next to me. I'm glad I'm doing it slowly. OK, so speaker one works. Speaker two works. So that, that's great. Um, and if you were really being particular, you might want to do a gain and delay calibration, which would be kind of fun to do sometime. I don't know. Is it difficult to set up an omnidirectional mic? No? Maybe it's worth doing. I think it's a really, it's a really useful thing to know how to do. OK, I'm going to save this. This is Studio One. OK, so now we have 32 speakers. We have our coordinates. We've confirmed that we can get sound out of all of our speakers. That's very important. Ronald, yep. Can you talk just a little bit about Spat's uh, speaker numbering uh, conventions? Is it? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, Spat is pretty agno. Whoa, whoa, what was that? Oh, that was. Sounded like feedback, but it was actually just the cup moving. Okay, um, Spat is pretty, pretty agnostic about um, speaker positions. It doesn't really care where they are. What it keeps track of is the order number that you put in. So if you like, actually, if we just what listen, order you type in? what order you in tell, which order you inform Spat? Well, okay, if it's in a list form, yeah. then. It's the order of the speakers in that list that define the, the speaker numbering. If you define it with the numbers, you can do that in a different order because you are assigning the actual number manually. But if it's in a list, it's in the order that you put it in. So yeah, if you notice here, I mean, some of these are pretty far apart from each other. Um, so, and it doesn't really matter for if, when you're working with it because it matters when you are, it matters when something goes wrong. <laughs> if, if for some reason um, the list you have doesn't correspond to your speaker order, then you have a problem. So, so long as there's a correct number of speakers and Spat knows what order ambisonic decoding it is, no. No, no. Um, so long as you have a list of numbers that where the the order corresponds to the actual plug that's the plug the wiring of the speakers. So channel one should be coming out of your system as channel one going to the speaker. Yeah, 
might be speaker one, right? And that would be speaker one. Now, if you, for some reason, you have, um, um, let's say you're using a Dante uh, aggregate device, and you have um, maybe some of your speakers actually, your first speaker is actually number 113. Um, SPAT still considers that speaker. If you, uh, when you're working in SPAT, you always start with one. And then the difference would be that your DAC number would be 113, starting with 113. But the order of the actual inlets goes from one to however many number of speakers as you have. As long as it's assigned, it's, it's appropriate for EED, quad head, it'll be accurate. Yes. So let me ask a much dumber question. Uh-huh. How does that know that your list is a nth order and sonic? Oh, it doesn't. We, we haven't said anything about encoding. All we're saying is this is where our speakers are. Actually, the only, in terms of ambisonics, um, that would be in the decoder. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But, um, but just, this is just, I'm just going through like nuts and bolts, like getting started. We haven't even done any panning, anything. We're just configuring. Now, I have a list, so I know I have 32 um, speakers. And as you know, I'm pretty lazy. So what I want to do is do this really quick. So I'm going to show you a nice trick for that. If you take an Uzi object and a ZL group object, the middle outlet, sorry, the rightmost outlet of Uzi sends a number from 1 to 32. Oh, by the way, sorry. I, want to, I need a DAC that goes from 1 to 32. But I don't want to type in 1 through 32 because I'm lazy. So now I'm going to use Uzi to get the index, and I'm going to collect a list of indexes and then send a bang when it's done and make a message object. And then I don't have to type my numbers out. When you have a lot of speakers, this will save you some time. I'm assuming you're all as lazy as I am. I am now. <laughs> Or maybe you just like elegance. I'm a big fan of elegance. <laughs> OK. So now we have a, a DAC with 32 channels. And we know that, um, hypothetically, when we did this test to step through the channels, we know that um, our azimuth elevation distance values are correct, because we checked that. Hypothetically, we didn't do that, but we know that it's probably right. Um, so then we're ready to try panning something. So then what we need to do is make a object to do that. So we'll say spat5 pan tilde at, uh, is it inlets or inputs? Inputs, I think, one at outputs 32. And so now I'm going to um, disconnect that testing DAC and now put this noise value into the SPAT pan. I'm going to connect the SPAT viewer to SPAT pan. And I'm going to make a SPAT 5 <laughs> multi-connect space 32. Select the SPAT pan and the DAC. Uh, maybe that's a bad idea. Hang on, let me think about it. Probably a better thing to do would be to do, put a, let's do spat five meter at channels 32. Does that work? Yep. Um, And now I'm going to select all three of those things and hit the exclamation mark and connect them. Now note, if we check the max window here, there's a message that says, signal connections made with DSP on will not take effect until resetting the DSP. So that means that this, these connections have not actually been made yet, because if you look down in this right bottom right corner, you'll see it's glowing blue. That means the DSP is on. 
So I need to turn that off. And I'm, before I turn that on, I'm going to go into, oh. Oh, OK. He took out the gain slider. OK, well, we, that means we need a different object here. My apologies. Times change. So I'm going to use a spat five times now. And this is just like a uh, asterisk tilde regular multiplication object, but does multiple channels. And I'm just going to um, put a line tilde and just have, so I have a, a I want to turn it down basically is what I'm doing. So I'm going to make a smooth line that hopefully this, this is familiar to everyone. Line tilde message with a dollar sign one replaces that value with the incoming float and adds 20 to it. Sorry, adds a 20 after it in a list, which means the um, ramp time to get to this value. So that just smooths out the values so that it doesn't jump too quickly. And I'm just going to inch this up slightly and then turn on the DSP, turn this up. So notice how quiet this is. So it's important to, when you have a lot of speakers, you need to be careful about amplitude. So now I'm curious what's going to happen now. Ah, so notice now there is no, so what, what are we trying to do? We want to pan the source around the room. Great. Um, but notice that in here, there are no sources. The sources are the blue, or sorry, green circles usually. So we need to add a value there. And so let's say comma in our o.expert code box, we'll say source number. And we just have one source now. And I was being a little sneaky before because I knew that um, we connected the spat viewer to, to spat pan, but we didn't actually initialize spat pan. Spat pan needs, also needs to know where the speakers are in order to do the panning. So if you just plug in spat viewer without initializing it to the pan, it's not going to do anything. Just plugging the cable in doesn't mean that the information is, has moved over. It's just opened a communication channel because it's a control rate value, not a signal rate value. So what I'm going to do now is bang on this message a few times to make sure it's thoroughly initialized. <laughs> OK, I think that should have done the trick. And now I have this source, but it's very quiet because the volume is down. And now it's over there. Cool. It seems really jumpy. I'm, I think something's wrong here. All right, let's investigate. OK, so I'm going to double click on spat pan. What do we see? We see panning type angular. Spread is 0. We have the speaker coordinates which are, remember that spat generally goes from where 0 is the front and negative uh, 90 is to your left. So here it's converted um, the azimuth of 331 to be negative 28. So it's the difference between 360 and 
And so it's, it's just wrapped it around. So that, that's correct. Um, so to me, what I'm hearing, I see overdrive is off. What I'm hearing is that it's jumping around a little bit. And I've. It's pretty weird, so it's right? It's not fading between the two speakers, right? Yeah. Um, OK, first thing I want to try is what if we just send, I'm going to use just a regular message right now and say source slash one slash asim dollar sign one. I'm going to use a regular Mac style message right now and see if that has a different behavior than spat viewer. Is it possible that my Dante setup is not quite right? Well, it's just, it's just like you're, you're between, between the two uh, so here's speaker one, two. Does this seem right to you, Jeff? Right, it's going up in the ring. Does it seem, everything seem? So that, that seems right? OK. Is it your pan law? I, don't, I wouldn't expect it to be the pan law. It, it seemed like it was doing something funny where it was yeah, let's let's try let's try setting the pan law. So let's say let's try um, panning type VBAP 3D. Um, and I'll I'm gonna go back to the spat viewer. It's kind of cool that, that there's a problem, too, because this, this could definitely happen. This could happen to you. OK, so now it says VBAP 3D. Did we get any error messages? I think we're OK. How does it sound to you? You know, I'm sitting like right next to these speakers. <laughs> what? It's not quite as choppy this time. Okay. Hmm? Does that seem wrong? Can you go back to the viewer? Mm hmm. Shouldn't it be over there? Uh, uh, you're, we're, we're, you're looking at this 90 degrees to how it is. Yeah, one, one is right here where I'm sitting. So yeah, it's, it's oriented this way. Uh, and everything's oriented as if you're facing the window. Got it. Okay, then that's it. Oh, yeah, it sounds way better over here than it does over here. <laughs> okay. And it's good to use white noise when you're testing this stuff because it's really not forgiving at all. <laughs> it really it brings out every bad quality of the system possible. Yes? Can you, like, rotate it as you offset it? So that it's oriented that way? Uh, yeah. So if we do this, we can send this a message. Um, 
yaw 90. I believe that's what we need. So now, one. While you do that, in terms of difference between the live dot game object and the spat five times object? Um, the spat five times is multiplying all of the incoming signals by a value here. Mm -hmm. And this, the gain object is. Not the gain, but the live gain. A live gain. They're very similar. Except that this is just purely multiplication. Mm -hmm. So you can use it for other things, too. Okay. Um, it looks like actually what we wanted is negative yaw, I think. So now this looks more accurate for, now this is oriented towards the screen. So that was this yaw message to spat transform. Okay. And it could be that the distance has something. So we're panning some white noise around. It, it also just kind of highlights that having a ring of 10 speakers in this room, they're still kind of far apart. Yeah, right, because it's a pretty big room, actually. Um, they're still over 20 feet. Um, so one, one thing you could do to maybe, if you wanted to, um, actually, let's pull up, I'm going to put that spat meter back in here, just so we can see what's really happening with the channels. I'll put it up here. So remember, we're using VBAP right now. So as I move the sound around, it's only playing three speakers at a time. Um, if we set, right, I'm going to move over to. Well, you can also, I mean, another way to set things, if you wanted to just use regular max messages, is you could uh, just put a comma here. And it will send them out sequentially. But sometimes when you're just initializing things, it really doesn't matter that much. Um, I want to change the spread. Remember yesterday, we were playing with the spread parameter. Let's hear what that effect has in a situation like this. So what it should do is. Um, Increase the spread. I just tried copying. Ooh, it works great. I just copied this from the that window. And now let's, um, oh, actually, let's make this a, a regular max message with a number sign. And let's listen to the effect of changing the spread. So I guess that's the maximum I can go. I think it goes up to 100. It's like percentages. So if we increase the spread a little bit, 
And then we do the pinning. It's a bit smoother, right? That's because these panning methods are picking the, the closest three speakers as the default when you have the, the smallest uh, spread. It's only using three speakers to locate the space in, in XYZ. Um, another thing we can do to um, improve the smoothness of an array is to do calibration. Would what, you change the spread to change the number of speakers involved? Yeah. So I, so. So if we look at here, if we turn the spread down to zero, there's only three speakers. Yeah, it's picking the three closest speakers. So it looks like here it's number two, nine, and 19. And if we look down here on the map, we can see that two, nine, and 19 are all in this region near the, where the source is. If I increase the spread, now we have one, two, three. So where's one? Uh, wow, one's way over here. That doesn't make any sense. Huh? Oh, it's on the floor. Huh. Oh, I see over here, one is quite close in the, in the z-axis. Yeah. So it's grabbing one in order to pull it down a little bit. Um, but it's a, it's a strong perceptual thing. It's a useful thing for smoothing out the movement. Another thing that, that happens if we, um, let's go back and listen to the, the speakers again. Um, just gonna, okay, the volume is down. It's safe to do this. Okay. So listen to the, listen to the color and gain of the speaker. Listen to the, how loud the speaker is. Like, those are pretty different, right? Some of them are really bright and loud, and some of them are a little softer. And that's just normal. I mean, speakers are not always the, they're the same. They're, they're. You're going to change their spectral coverage. You're going to change their gain and their distance, right? Well, this, I mean, the spectral qualities can change too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the distance has, is part of it because. If we look at the viewer, it's not a it's not a sphere, right? So we're in a we're in a uh, rectangular room as usually we will be, and the speakers are placed at a convenient location to to cover as much of the space as possible. So what we do to try to improve the um, the sound in a room is calibrate and. Um, uh, Jeff has been kind enough to plug in a, a microphone for us. Is that, should I be able to just grab that out, out yeah, of this? Yeah, hopefully you should see it on me, but one. Okay, let's see. All right, cool. So this is there in the middle of the room now. There's an omnidirectional microphone. You want to use an omnidirectional microphone for this. Um, and the way you can calibrate the the gain is to there's a tool in SPAT that sends out a noise burst out of each speaker and measures the gain. And then after it's done, it will output a list of gains that you can use to normalize the the values. So I'm going to make a new, actually, I'm going to do this in a sub-patch. And it's called spat five. Oh, wait, calibrate. There it is, calibrate. Gain and, and there's also calibrating delay because when you have you know a lot of most panning methods are they want basically a perfect sphere 
around the listener, around the, the middle of the listening space, where so that when you distribute the energy between two points, that the time arrival to the center should be the same from every speaker, and the gain should be the same, so that when you apply a panning method, the results are as accurate as possible for what to produce the virtual experience that, that you're looking for. So let's, let's go through calibrating the gain and delay. So let's first go to the help patch for SPAT calibrate, because it's, this is exactly what we need. Um, I'm going to grab right here in the help patch basically everything. Okay. <laughs> Um, and of course, we're going to need 32 speakers, not eight. And I'm going to just delete this whole thing over here because I'm just going to use o.compose. And I'm going to take the last outlet, I think. The last outlet is where the values come out when it's done. And then I'll go back to our other patch, and I will take copy the DAC, the times, and our, our gain control over here. Paste that in. And connect. Oop. Paste in my spat multi-connect and connect that. I'm going to set just, I just copied this in, so um, I don't think that the values were set automatically. Whoop, hang on. What was it? Uh, I think it was three seconds, right? That seems like a long time. Three seconds, OK. That's funny, but if I type in three, it goes to 50 milliseconds, OK? All right, I'll set it to 3.12, just to be different. And we'll use white noise. If you double click on here, it will remember it gives us the status window. So we can double, we can confirm the length is 3,000 seconds, um, milliseconds, haha. Uh, the type is white noise, and that's all we really need to know. And then, once we hit start, it's going to send out, oh, what's this? negative 30 dB. That looks interesting. Um, let's go back to the help patch. Ah, that's going to the spec, I mean to the live gain, so we don't care about that. Okay, good. Set this to zero. Okay, so remember that this is going to send out a noise burst. So what I'm going to do is, once when I hit start, it's going to go out of every speaker. And I don't, I'm not sure how loud I want that to be yet. So I'm, I'm going to start at zero and, and slowly ease it in. And then it's going to go through the whole system. And then we'll do it again at the right level. And I can see here that the gain is coming in from the speaker. So what's happening is the, the uh, calibrate gain is sending out the noise out of each channel. And then it's measuring what it receives through the microphone. Oh, right now? Or, yeah, what did you say is I think what's going to happen is when, when it finishes mm -hmm. doing its um, uh, uh, noise bursts, it's going to output the gains that it, oh, okay. it determined were the, what we need to normalize the system. OK. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's really odd. Now, we want to make sure that we have a pretty good amount of gain at the speaker, so I'm going to turn it up a little bit loud. It should be just as loud as you can handle it without being uncomfortable. Okay. 
So that's pretty annoyingly loud. So I'm just going to um, turn it off so we don't have to hear it. But I think like 0.05 seems to be pretty good. So I'm just going to wait until this is done. Or maybe just turn it up slightly a little bit more. You also want to make sure that nobody's talking when you do this or opening doors or anything, because it's it, anything you do will affect the the calibration. Three minutes seems or three seconds seems a little too long too. I'm just gonna make it a little shorter. So here's what it, we got. So it, it measured the gains, and it gave us a list of calibration gains. So you'll notice in the calibration gains, there's one value that's 0. So that is the quietest speaker that it found. And so what it's doing is it's lowering the levels of all of the other speakers to match the quietest speaker. But probably that will change when we, when we actually do it. OK, so let's do it for real this time. I'm going to turn it up slightly. Feel free to cover your ears if, if you don't want to hear it. OK, ready? So there was um, some floor noise, maybe, but probably. Hmm? Oh, it's, yeah, it's down here. So it's in a different spot. Um, I guess probably a little foot traffic won't hurt too much. I think it'll be OK. I don't really feel like sitting through that again. Anyway, so here we have our calibration gains. Great. So now we, well, one thing we could do is off. So basically, what we need to do now is apply these gains to the speakers. So how do we do that? Well, let's go. Huh? That's weird. OK. Um, OK. So I'm going to copy this and go into our panning patch. I'm going to zoom out a tiny bit. Oh. Oh, that was, yeah, that's what happened. Oh, I, yeah, I had too many things connected when I, when I did that. It's the danger of using scripts. Whoa, and you don't want to send, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> I wonder if that screwed up the, probably, that definitely could have screwed up the um, calibration we just did. But maybe not. 
I don't know. Let's see. It probably, so there was a DC offset, I guess, because that was plugged in. So there was, that was stupid. I'm sorry. Um, should I do it again? I don't know. Let's see, let's see if it, I, I want to test it and see if, if we can hear that it's better than before. If it's not good, we can blame it on all the other factors that happened. So I think what we need now is an object called spat5 diag matrix at channels 32. And if we go to the help patch, we can s learn about it. We see that, so what spat diag matrix does is it applies a multiplication, a separate number multiplication to every inlet. So let's say you have, in this case, there's it's kind of like a mixer in some ways. If you have, there's four inputs, and you send a list of four values. So here are gains. If you, if you see that, huh? Oh, that's gains, right, okay. Huh? I'm confused by that. That doesn't make sense to me. Sorry. Oh, it's going from one to negative one. Okay, the point here is that you can—it's a multiplication. Okay, so this multi-slider goes from negative one to positive one, and you can see that as I move, as these get close to zero, the value goes down. So there, I've hit zero for the second channel, and you can see that it multiplies the second inlet by zero, and so you have. You're nothing there. So we can use that to correct our um, panning by using these gains here. So I'm going to copy this list of gains, paste it in here, and um, now the gains here are linear gains. That means it goes from zero to one amplitude, not decibel. So what's gonna happen if I send these gains in just the way they are here? Can anybody tell me? What's, what's the problem here? It's gonna be really loud. This is dangerous. You could hurt yourself, so don't, be careful. So, Let's go back to the help patch. I noticed over here that there's, you can also send gains dB, and that sets it to dB. So actually, I'm gonna make a note to say that output of spat five calibration gain should be gains dB, not gains. because we don't, we want to, yeah, to reduce the cognitive load here a little bit. So I'm going to plug that in here to the diag matrix, hit the bang, and double click on it, and double check that my gains are what I expect them to be. And I can see now that, yes, that looks about right. So it's not in dB, it's in linear values. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I think it's always DB. I think it's always DB. OK, so now it's safe to connect these things. I'm first going to, even though it's safe, I'm going to turn off the volume, set my output gain to 0. Amplitude, I should say. Oops. Ah, so that's what happened before. What did I do? Whoa. Huh? I've been having trouble with the multi-connect as well. Interesting. Very interesting. OK. I think because I added, I don't know. There's some, that's a bug somewhere. My fault. 
Sorry. Okay, that all looks good. Turn it on. Notice there's no input, so now I'm going to put this noise there. I'm going to increase it a little bit and then in interrupt this gain a little bit. Okay, there we go. To me, that seems a little smoother. Let's uh, bypass. Um, we can add a slash uh, DSP slash bypass to the Diag matrix down here. Most SPAT objects have a bypass option. And let's, to test it, I'm going to use um, spat5 around. So this is just a tool to make it go to count. OK, so this is, this is without the gain calibration. And this is with the gain calibration. It's a pretty significant difference. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm not going to turn it up a little bit. So that's with the gain calibration, and this is without. So it's a lot. Now I'm going to turn it back on. So here's with the calibration. So pretty good, right? Much better. Yeah. Is that a, um, is that, that, that seems really significant. Yeah. Like this 6 dB in the bottom and 9 dB in the attenuation. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that typical for a system? Yeah, pretty typical. Yeah. Do you feel that this was an accurate caliber? Sort of. I mean, since, since um, there was a little, you yeah. know, it's not perfect, uh, wasn't a perfect recording, I would probably do it again if I would really, yeah. if this was like for performance. But you would maybe. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I could hear it just just hearing the speakers. Like some of them are much louder than others. Um, there's also spectral differences. Right. There's not an automated tool for doing um, frequency calibration that I know of in here, but um, that's something that professional engineers will do very frequently. Is actually EQ each speaker as well. Mm -hmm. So right. another thing that we do is the delay calibration. So let's do that. Mm -hmm. Ah, <coughs> I, um, there's, if you highlight and go to the left of the object, there's a little triangle that shows up, and then you can click on that and go transform to B patcher. I know, it's, I know it's pretty cool, right? All right, so I'm going to turn that off for now. So my computer seems to be having, I don't know what else is running, I guess that's it. Okay, so let's go back to our calibrate patch. And now, let's go to the SPAT calibrate delay patch. And that's basically the same. It has a sweep order message. So I'm going to just copy that. And I guess that's the only thing that it really cares about. Sweep excitation sequence. The doubling of the order should be longer than the 
delay to estimate. I don't know what that means, so I'm just going to copy this. There's basically it's adjusting the the length of the sign sweep. So we will go with 16 because that's the default. And we also need the speakers 32. And I'm just going to go ahead and plug that into the same times because the gain the calibrate gain is off right now, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, and I'll use the same ADC object. And this one also has a start message that it takes. So this one's a sign sweep, but as before, I don't know how loud it should be, so I'm going to mute it and try it and slowly increase the amplitude. Yeah, let's do that. Right, so probably like 0.06 is okay. So we just have to wait until that's done. Oh, don't forget to look at the output. I'm going to save this one for the gains over here and make a new one, a new o.compose o for the delays. Pretty slow. I wonder if the football game's on. But the delay really does have a have an effect, so I think it's worth the wait, even though it's difficult to sit through. I could probably reduce this order. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it could be. In this case, it's for delay. So we're, it's measuring the, the, the difference in, basically the difference in distance between the speakers and the center of the room. And it, and it will compensate for the differences. OK, so now that we've done that, I'm going to turn it up. And we'll have to sit through that. Apologies. And be and just try to be quiet so that we can get a good result. Here we go. Yay. Phew. When do okay. I use this to set this an impulse? Um, I guess it's more accurate. It has more time to, to be accurate. I mean, it, uh, I guess a single impulse is harder to track because it has. Yeah, double frequencies. More right, more yeah. Sound yeah, I mean, yeah. OK, so now we have our delays. And we can see here there's one that has zero. Um, delay. So as before, as with the the volumes, the the delays are similar. It takes the it compensates for the speaker with the longest delay, and 20 milliseconds, pretty much. That's or 19 milliseconds. That's a pretty big delay. Okay. So let's copy, paste, and now we're just going to take the delays part of this. So I'm going to delete the other part. And now we need to delay. So let's use spat 5 delay tilde at channels 32. Uh, 
Another thing that I always do um, when I'm setting up in any large scale system is I put spat 5 tan h at the before the output of the patch. This is a soft clipping, or yeah, has a sort of soft clipping behavior. It's a uh, hyper, what's it called? Somebody knows better than. What's, what's tan h stand for again? Hyperbolic. Hyperbolic tangent, thank you. I am not a mathematician, sadly. Um, but I have sent very loud things out of the speakers, and I know that, that this is really bad. So what tan h does is it um, will make sure that your, your output, it, it takes the input and will not output anything that is outside the range of negative 1 to positive 1. So that means that if suddenly you were to send something foolishly loud out, it will save you a little bit. It will still send out 0 dB. That's, that's still possible, which is quite loud, but hopefully not more than that. OK, so now we have delays, but we haven't set anything. Let's go to the help patch and see if slash delays is what it wants. And indeed, that's what it, it wants. Great. So now we can send the measurement that we made of the delays to spat 5 delay. Click. And I'm just going to copy this DSP bypass option. And so we can AB compare that. OK. So it's turned down. I'm going to slowly turn it up. I'll put our spat around back on. OK, so this now has gain and delay uh, calibration. So it should be as smooth as we can make it without doing frequency EQ for each speaker. So let's bypass that now. This is without the delay compensation calibration. This is with. And here is just the delay calibration without the gain calibration. Here's with both again. So moral of the story is that <clears throat> even in a a, you know, a place like here, I mean, no matter what system you're on, you need to calibrate it. That's just, it doesn't matter how nice your speakers are. They're, going, they're not going to be in the perfect position. There's going to be some variation from the manufacturer. If you want to have a well-sounding system, you need to calibrate. That's it. I mean, oh, uh, you, spectrally? Is that what you said? Yeah, like the response will different. Well, there is, um, there, at the moment, I think there are only those two calibration, automatic calibration. There's speaker config, but that's, that's not it. Um, basically, you want spat. You would need to put a filter on each channel, and you would you could use something like spat cascade tilde, which is a, a, a array of um, uh, by quads. You can have a you know as many as you want, whatever order you want, and um, and you can do frequency calibration that way. But there's not uh, that I know of. There's not an automatic tool for that. That is released. I think actually there is one at Aircam that I've seen. 
on spat revolution. Ah, I don't know. I only use the the max spat library. Yes. Um, in terms of calibrating texturing, do you think it would make more sense to do that not in max? So, for example, if you have mm. like the general system that calibrates itself. Yeah, that's what you should then, use. Yeah. Yeah, that seems like it would be a more efficient way of doing that rather than having arrays and fine plots for every single. Well, channel. if I mean. I don't know what they're using, but probably they have some filters that they're using to come. So it's just, but I mean, yeah, if it's in a standalone piece of hardware, then that's, that's fine too. And some mixing boards have gain, you know, there might be, there's other ways to do this, but if it's just you and your computer in the room, then this gets you pretty far there. So now that we have a system that is relatively calibrated, let's um, let's first take a more uh, sorry one second um, let's take a sample sorry let's use the trusty Telemon bassoon sample. Yeah, so you just need to load bang them. Um, similarly with the speaker coordinates up here, anything that is part of your um, calibration process should be initialized when you start the patch with a load bang. Um, and since um, at the moment SPAT requires uh, SPAT objects take OSC bundles now, but they're still very particular about which messages you send. They only want to read certain ones. So you have to send individual bundles to different objects. You can't send the same bundle to every object. So maybe someday they'll fix that. I think they will probably. But for now, you have to send the gains to the diag matrix and the delays to here. What I would like to do is, is um, put them all in one bundle like this, mm -hmm. and then just send the same bundle to everything, and then it would all just read the thing that it cared about and ignore everything else. But. And that would be the benefit of using these OSC message composition boxes over just a message box. Basically. Right, because basically then you could, you could contain all of your calibration data in one place rather than having it spread out all over the place. So in, when I'm generally teaching Max, that's generally the approach that I like to take is to centralize everything and keep everything bound together so that your state is kind of in a snapshot, very, very um, coordinated and not having a lot of different streams going because the more streams you have, the more chances for things to get out of whack. And it becomes, it's just some, easier to think about a, a fluid, stream of, of data. But that's, that's just philosophy. Kind of. OK. So we've listened to noise. Let's listen to Telemon. And we'll just start again with the spat pan. And turn on the DSP. Very quiet.
When you play beautiful, happy things through the... <laughs> when you play sounds that sound good, your system is gonna sound better. So if we send like harsh white noise through the system, it's gonna sound, it's gonna expose all of the imperfections of the system. So if you, but if you send something that is very clean, it's, it might mask, it might not expose all of those um, imperfections. I think... Uh, I think the, I think the Max didn't convert this file, so it's, it's playing, it's a little faster than it should be. Okay, so now we're, remember, now we're just, we're just panning right now. We're using VBAP. So let's now try increasing the, the spread like we did before. Becomes more omnidirectional. But it's still it's still just panning. So let's quickly. Yeah, sure. So here's without the gains or without the delays. the gain correction. And with. So you can hear it, it reduces the gain for many of the speakers, but it has a much smoother value and it's easy to compensate for the loss of gain. Okay. So right now we're panning that source around the speakers in the room. Um, there's no reverb. There's no distance, uh, distance attenuation. And that means that the source is really on the speaker array. So it's really the, the perceived distance of that sound should be, let's listen to it again while we're talking about it. The distance of the sound is moving on the kind of bubble that we're in. Oh yeah, thank you. So we're we're in a we're in a bubble of speakers. And the source is always the same distance. So that's fine for panning, but let's um Put in now, instead of using, let's see, okay, so SPAT Viewer is for viewing sources and it can be an interface for moving sounds around. SPAT Pan is a basic panning object. Most typically, people will, you will use um, SPAT SPAT to, um, to use the, uh, the SPAT perceptual model for spatial um, placement, spatialization. And to, uh, as you all know, since you did your homework from yesterday, <laughs> you have read the manual and you've looked at spat opera and spat spat. And if you go to the spat opera help patch, I expected it to be bigger than that. Let's go to the spat spat help patch. Ah, all right. Anyway, um, there's source messages, room messages, but the main way to control the spat perceptual model is the spat opera. And so in spat opera, it has a, a bunch of tabs on the left. So these are the different sources. And then, so those are S1, S2, S3, source one, source two, source three. And then there's a uh, reverb tab. And, and it has a viewer here. So this is just like spat viewer, but now we have 
a perceptual model for the sources. So let's just cut right to the chase and without even talking about it, I believe we could initialize that. And now if we double click on spat opera and zoom out, we, no, okay. Uh, error messages. Code box does not. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Wait, really? Interesting. Okay. So, spat5 transform. What's it sending out? Let's see. Oh, that's annoying. Come on, man. Is that real? Ah. So when you send in a list, it outputs each speaker individually as messages. I think it hasn't been updated to the SPAT5 format to use a, a bundle output. Um, but when I send the yaw message, it sends out a full packet. And it has to be a full packet to be used um, with ODOT and with OSC. I mean, yeah, with, with ODOT, so. But if I click on yaw, then now if I open the SPAT opera, I can see the speakers are there. So just like before. OK, so now let's play our bassoon again. I'm going to turn down the volume just in case. It's too loud. Turn it on. And now we're in a room. And I'm going to attach this, this around thing to the spat opera. And here you can see the sources moving around. Okay. So <clears throat> OK, let me explain a few things. OK, so right now we have this spat around B patcher. Actually, all it's doing is sending out a number. It's basically a line object that's just looping a progression of uh, 0 to 360. And, um, and actually, we could just as easily do something like have a phaser in here. Use scale, tilde, 0 to 1, 0 to 360. And do snapshot 100. And that will send out a number every 100 milliseconds going from, huh? That's weird. Why is it stopping? Hmm. Pretty sure it's still coming out. Whoa. That's bizarre. Anybody understand what's going on here? I think that it's still coming out, but I think that my computer is doing something weird. I'm also running a beta version of Max. I apologize for that. computer is unhappy right now. All right, so actually let's... Phaser is 0 to 1. If we go to scope, you can see that. When the DSP is on, at least. Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. 
But it's signal, right? So it should always be. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I think something's weird. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to save this and I'm going to put a load bang up there and here. I'm probably going to have to, let's see. So the sequence up here is important because we need to, when we, when we initialize this, we need to set the, the yaw to the spat transform needs to be set. Actually, there's an attribute for many spat5 objects, which is at init with, I believe. And then in quotes, you can put a OSC, a, a comma separated list of OSC messages in there. And that should initialize it with. We can double check by double clicking, and we can see, yes, in fact, it did initialize with that value. So now I don't need to send that message in anymore. And that simplifies our initialization process here. OK, so now I'm going to save. I'm going to quit this beta version and open a more stable version, which I think will solve that problem. Oh, really? Wait, what, what's the problem? It says that by that author, processing speaker slash Oh, I think that's the problem. Like I was saying that um, when, here, let me open up the patch. Yeah, is it, oh, is it, is it this the message you're getting? No, no, I'm, not, I'm actually skipping that, so I'm sending that, that message um, directly. Ah, oh, okay. And you're getting, so you're doing this? Yeah. Ah, but spat opera needs to know how many speakers to have. Yeah, so I use a trigger and I send that first and then I use the other one. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what if you click it twice? Because okay. it works for me. Yeah, so you you get, yeah, apologize for that. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just going to keep trucking on here. Um, so one thing you can do is um, if you're using ODOT and you get into this situation where SPAT is sending out um, single a non-bundle uh, OSC messages, you can use the ODOT var object to upgrade any message that comes in to be a bundle. And that will just make that go that error message go away. So that's o.var. OK, so now let's go back to our test. And hopefully, now if I turn this on, turn this up, don't hear anything. Ah, I know why. Need to select the virtual sound card. There we go. Okay, so that's better. So now, so let's look at Spat Opera. So, so here we are in Spat Opera, and let's. So, so we have one source and we have a reverb. So in the source tab, we have a bunch of perceptual factors. We have some filters. There's two filters, an axis and an omni filter. Let's talk about those first. So the axis filter is the, is the sound that's moving from the source directly to the listener. The omni is the, a filter for the sound from the source that's going to the room directly. So let's hear what that means. Okay, so now if I go to the Omni filter, 
Oh, sorry. So for both filters, for both filters, there are a bunch of knobs at the bottom. The first one is the global value. And then there's low, medium, and high gains. And then these are cutoff frequencies for the filters. So there's, it's a uh, high, mid, sorry, low, mid, high shelf filter in here. So now if I turn the gain back up. Now I'm going to turn down the omni gain. And th this phaser is going pretty fast, so I'm just going to slow that down a little bit. So now there's no reverb, right? So we've, we've cut the filter that controls the sources send to the reverb, which is separate from the direct sound. This is useful to have potentially different spectral qualities of the direct sound to the room sound. If you double click, it jumps back up to zero. So now let's turn down the axis gain. So this is only the reverb, only the omnidirectional sound. Now it's both. So for instance, sometimes I like to boost the direct Wow, I don't hear that really at all. It could be because the room presence is not very high. Ah. It seemed to not be initialized. So the perceptual factors are the source presence. Let's so turn this up. Now it's, it's louder. If I turn it down, it's less present. Um, if I, I'm going to turn off this uh, automated thing. OK. So now, I've, the source is at a distance of one meter. Oops. Oh, I can't type that in? OK. OK, the source is at a distance of about, about one meter. And I'm turning the source presence up all the way. So now if I grab this point and I drag it around, and I notice that I think I don't have that most recent version of SPAT here, because there's some things that have been fixed. So watch what's, what's happening. So now, when the source moves away, it's pretty far away, right? It has a distance to it. And notice when you go through the middle, what happens? Kind of whips through the middle. So now let's see, so let's say, let's turn up the room presence. Down. So the room presence has an, uh, the, these are all, sorry. So the perceptual factors here, this is, um, worth reading about in the manual. Um, these are, in particular, so source warmth is a, basically a filter that, that boosts um, low, mid frequencies, gives a kind of a warm sound. Source brilliance has an increased uh, high frequency range. Um, 
you know, filters. And then the room presence, running reverberance, and envelopment are parameters that um, affect the relationship between the early reflections and the late reverb in the, in the room. Um, and down here in the um, position orientation, a very important parameter here is aperture. So you know, I'm just talking without playing, just so we can see it for a second, and then we'll listen to the result. But at, look what happens when I move this aperture. The, there's a white circle that opens up around the source. That is like, if you can imagine, um, it, you know, I'm talking to you. I don't know if Marcus did this already, but I'm, I'm talking to you th with um, my hands around my mouth, which is uh, making my direct um, sound waves that I'm sending out be more directional. Um, if I do this, you should hear a bit more of the room, probably. If I do this, you'll hear a bit less of the room. So that's what's going on in SPAT. Um, and uh, if I turn this way, now you are hearing pretty much only the uh, early and, and late reflections and, and late reverberation of my voice. And then as I turn back, you're hearing the direct sound also. And so that's what the, the axis is, this direct sound. And, as I, and then the omni is when I'm facing this way, what is the spectral quality of the, of the, the room's influence on the, on the source? And the aperture is the width. So if, you, know, you see my hands are kind of cupped in a very narrow way. Hypothetically, I'm making my voice even more directional. And as I open my hands, the uh, radiation pattern from my mouth is getting larger and going to more parts of the room and activating the room's reverberance. So let's hear the effect of that. So I'm going to start with the aperture all the way down. At the, I guess the lowest is a 10, 10 degree opening. And now listen to what happens as I open it up. So when it's all the way open, the sound is going to the room and reverberating everywhere. And as I decrease it, it becomes drier, more directional. What is the pan reverse control? Is the pan reverse somewhere? What is the pan say? Oh, 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 oh. Um, here? Mm -hmm. Pan reverb. Trying to remember. Um, in SPAT 4, I made a patch once that's in the SPAT 4 tutorials called Patching SPAT. And in here, it's a patched version of the entire. So, so using SPAT objects, so SPAT SPAT is a wrapper around many. Uh, there's a uh, feedback delay network, and for the late reverb, there's a bunch of filters, there's delays, there's panning, and all of these different modules are contained within SPAT SPAT. But you can make the same, you can make SPAT with patches. Actually, the earlier versions of SPAT were patches. The earliest versions were, were I think, even using standard Max uh, objects. And so you can, you can really create all of this. Um, now, I don't remember where the pan reverb goes to. Actually, another useful uh, way to see what these different parameters do is to check out, there's another spat opera object called spat opera underscore. Spat Opper um, is this is a high level control, um, and Spat Opper underscore is a low level control. And if you go to the example patch on Spat 
opera underscore, it has a bunch of um, filters laid out here. And if we open up spat opera and do some experiments with the parameters here, I'm moving. So you can see as I move, it's a little slow. The, the GUI is a little slow because there's a lot of graphics going on here. But um, as I move the source away, you can see that it's actually, SPAT is adjusting many filters as the source moves. And if I change the parameters here, it will also change the filters. So if I turn up the room uh, presence, it's, you can see that it's increasing the gain of the reverb and increasing the, what is that parameter? Oh, reverb, I think it's reverb gain. So it's increasing the gain of the reverb. Running reverberance, oops, sorry, let me raise that up a bit. Running reverberance has an, a relationship between the, um, the sources, sorry. Okay, yeah, so these, actually these both, on both sides here are actually the same thing. So let's just look at one of these, okay. So you can just ignore, here I'll just do this. Okay, here we go. Okay, so now as I increase the running reverberance, you can see that the cluster value is going down and the early is going down. Um, what does cluster and early mean? So, so here's, here's the general overview for the DSP chain in SPAT. And here's the general um, reverb model that's used in SPAT. So there's a direct sound. And then it's, this is sort of the, the impulse response terminology that's used in SPAT. There's a direct early reflections. And then SPAT refers to something called a cluster, which is in between the early reflections and the reverb. They was, was determined in some perceptual tests to be a relevant um, stage in the uh, impulse response. And then there's the late reverberations, which is kind of decorrelated um, late reverberation. So for each of these stages, there are filters in, in spat spat that uh, affect the way that the um, room model is, um, is heard. So back to our example here, these perceptual factors are multi dimensional controls over, over filters. So the running reverberance, let's, and let's hear it. Let's not just talk about it. Um, why don't I, I'm gonna copy this and put it in our patch with the bassoon. Make a new patch. Let's see, actually I'm going to paste encapsulate, make an inlet, and put the output of spat opera into here. So the, the output of spat opera is the low level messages. And let's, so here is a view, low level. Ah, getting a little messy, sorry. Okay, so let's hear what, 
what, what happens when we increase the running reverberance? I'm also, I'm gonna turn up the presence here just to, just to turn it up a bit. Okay. So that's all the way up. I'm not hearing a really big difference. That's probably because our aperture is so low. I just reduced the room presence. So there's a bit less of the early reflections in late um, in cluster. So it's, I believe it's a increase of the um, so it's reducing the early reflections in the cluster. So there's there's less um, there's fewer of the close delays that are happening right after the, the direct sound, if that makes sense. So envelopment. So if it's all the way down, there's looks like there is no. So this is direct, room, early, and cluster here. And this is the late reverberation gain. So envelopment turns down the direct sound and increases the early reflections. And if there's less envelopment, there's less early reflections and more direct sound. And these are values that, that, that affect the the sense of a source's presence in a space. And that's why, that's why we're, we, reverb is really useful when you're trying to create virtual spatial scenes is that uh, it puts the source in a, in a space rather than just being on the bubble of the sphere of the speakers. It says, it gives us more information about this, about the spatial location of the of the source in the space. Very quick question. So it looks like the aperture is snapped to the head, right? So whenever you move the source around. Ah, yes. So is there a way to sort of unlock that or, or rather lock it so that it's in a fixed the aperture is in a fixed direction. It's not oh. to the head? Yeah, there is a way to do that. Um well, you don't need to I that is an option, and I forget which object it is, but um, I can try to remember for you. Is so this, there's no place where you put in any room dimensions? There's this other tab that we haven't talked about yet. Okay. <laughs> That's why I was hesitating whether we should start on this today or not. Okay, but I think it's good to just power through it because <clears throat> we don't really have that much, that many days, so. Um, so the, the reverberation tab is where you can set parameters for the, the room. And so the green is the early reflections, these green lines, the blue lines are the cluster, and then here is the, the late reverberation. The direct is not shown. The direct is just the direct sort, uh, signal that comes in. So we don't have... Um, we don't have room dimensions in the sense of length, width, and height, but we do have a uh, cubic meters. So we can... <laughs> nice. 
So the source is, I'm gonna turn up the presence a little bit. Turn up the aperture. Turn up the room presence. Turn up the reverberance. So this is, uh, it seems quite quiet for some reason. Um, all right. Oh, maybe because the envelopment is done? Ah, yeah. So you see, when it's more enveloped, it's like it's, it's swallowed in the space, right? It's, absorbed into the reverb. So if you have a little less envelopment, so the envelopment here is, it's talking about the envelopment of the source, not of, not of the listener. So one of the things I like to do is kind of like a dub reggae sort of thing where you have a, a source here and then you can do things like, like suddenly, jump the, the aperture up. And actually, let me just turn down. This is kind of ridiculously high, you know? Right, so, so it, so with those parameters, it's, um, it's like an aux send in a way. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can kind of burst things into the reverb. And so the, but the, I guess the aperture also would be an important dimension when you're, depending on the type of instrument you're performing, with, right? I mean, if it's percussion versus bassoon versus. I think but it's more about the relationship of the, um, the, the amount of directivity of the source and the room. So it could be that you have a, a snare drum that you want to be incredibly reverberant. Or you may radiate. So you may want, when you hit a snare, you may want it to be like, just fill everything. Or you, know, um, you may want to hit the same sound. So just a percussive sound it doesn't have to be a snare, but some kind of percussive sound. And you may want it to cut through the scene and have less reverb on it. Um, and you can manipulate this from a kind of just normal sound engineering kind of way. So but more directional this term. Uh, yes. This big where the aperture is naturally, by virtue of the instrument, narrower. Mm. Right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could, you could, actually you could do things like um, if you wanted to, you could even put filters on. Like, let's say you wanted to have different radiation patterns for different frequency ranges of the instrument, like with a saxophone or you know bassoon or something like that that has very complex radiation patterns in different frequency ranges. You could have different filters and have different radiation patterns at uh, different and and just stack them up together, but have different uh, radiation patterns. Do you have a question? Yeah, there's a lot you can do. For instance, the pan tilde object mm -hmm. doesn't have to be used to pan um, a sound in between speakers. You could also use that to pan between different processes. Also, fun thing with spat pan, if you, did I delete it? What did I do with it? If you take that pan, uh, 
you can send a sig, send, just send a one into it. Actually, I'm just gonna go to the help patch to do it quicker. So, and I'm not gonna send this out here. And I'm not gonna send it out there. Uh, well, yeah, I guess I will. Okay, so here, if I send in just a one, It's going to output just the amplitude value, basically. And you can use that to control, you can multiply that with other, like a bus, for instance. So let's say you have, um, um, you could crossfade between different processes if you want. Just think about a spat viewer in your mind and the speakers are actually different effects that you're sending the source into. And so you can actually use spat to pan between, um, to crossfade between different um, effects change, chains. Because all panning is, is sending, is balancing amplitude out of different outlets. So if you want to put those into different processes, you could crossfade between, okay, I think I could do that quickly, let's see. Yeah, I mean, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the world is your oyster. Basically, you can you can do anything, anything like that. So basically, what what would that mean? So let's say, let's just. Uh, I think we probably should wrap up pretty soon. But let's um, just as a thought experiment, let's paste in our bassoon. And so, like, what do, what would you want to do? Exactly. Can you say that again? That you wanted to pitch shift or? Is there some sort of like widener? I don't know actually if there's, if like Max has a, like a widener. A widener? Like a, just something that would change the, the pitch by a few cents. Hmm. Yeah, well there's, yeah, there's like a gizmo, right? Um, or freak shift. I guess these are both. Yeah, freak shift, okay. Okay. All right, we can go back to the other patch. Okay, so now let's say we have two sources. And one will be a frequency shifted version of the original. And now if we go into spat upper, we have two sources. And yeah. They're both the same gain right now. I think that's gonna be okay. Let's see. Ready? I'll turn it down, I'll turn it down. Okay. <laughs> This version of SPAT has a bug with the Doppler, I think. Okay, so here's number two. Actually, let's just, I don't hear anything right now, so I'm just gonna unplug that. Okay, that's working. Okay. Surprised that, oh, I guess that's just the source pre presence. 
Okay, so now we are just hearing the source two. I wish that were a bit louder. I'm gonna put another, oh, I'll just. All right, I'm gonna put another gain here. Yeah, I'm just gonna plug this directly into there, I think. Oh, the, sorry, the source presence is all the way down. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay, so that, I mean, of course, when you're dealing with frequency, it gets, you know, you have to be a little careful. So, um, to make it sound good, I mean, um, let's just say something more easy, like delay. And then this uses samples, so I'm gonna say milliseconds to samples. So now there's just a single delay. So if I, let's say I send a click in, that's always fun. using drum machine sounds this whole time. Tomorrow we'll use drum machines. Questions? Yes, so a good way to learn what to, what to send in. Thank you for asking. There's two um, outputs, main outputs, there's more than two. The, the first two outlets are the most important outlets of SPAT Opera. The leftmost is low level output, and the second one is high level output. I believe you can use either of these. Um, let's start with high level. Let's mainly talk about high level. So here, if I change one of these, you can see the output is source one pres. That stands for source presence. Here I've changed the aperture. So then you just, so now I wanna, let's say I wanna have the aperture go to 10 suddenly. Goes down. Uh, yeah. Well, you can use so you can use um, like we were doing here. You can use a regular max message, or you can use uh, O.Pack pack to put it into there. Um, Um, yeah, right. So let's say, all right, this is going to be the very last thing we do today. Because I'm getting a little tired. Um, okay. Okay, crash course in ODOT mapping. So here we have a phaser that's being scaled 
from 0 to 360. Let's say we just have a number that is not 0 to 360. It's just a number that's going from 0 to 1 at a certain speed. Right now, we're going at every 200 milliseconds. We could bump that up to um, 100 milliseconds, sure. So now we have a, num a ramp that's going from 0 to 1. So let's map that to some parameters. First, I'm going to make an o.pack. I'm going to call that slash v for value, or t for time. Yeah, let's do t. So now if we just look at that, we're going to have a, a o dot t going up. You know, I'm going to just put this in a sub patch so we can think about it a little bit more clearly. Can everybody read that OK? A little small. OK. So we're going from 0 to 1 over a certain hertz, because phaser takes hertz. OK. So let's make an o.expert code box. And let's say, for starters, let's say source one asm equals scale slash t from zero float to one float to zero float to 360 float. So it's just like what we were doing with the max scale tilde object before. But now we are scaling t instead. And so now we get very, something very similar. So now the cool thing about o.expert is we don't have to stop there. We have t. We have this ramp, this abstract number that is moving, this time. We have time moving, and we want some things to be changing in the course of this time. So at, to begin with, we are, we are making a time. We're scaling that time to be the time it takes to go 360 degrees around. But we can also control other things, like we can say source 1 um, elev equals scale t 0 to 1, 0 to 90. And let's make this phaser, let's actually make this a cycle. And then we'll scale from negative 1 to positive 1. So now we have an azimuth and an elevation coming up. So let's make an outlet here for our mapping, LFO, and put that into the spat opera. And now let's open up here, and we can see now that this, the source is moving around, both in elevation and in azimuth. Let's hear what that sounds like. Oh, oops. Do -do 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 -do. It's a little fast. I'm going to slow it down a little bit. So we do have speakers above, so we can we can talk about elevation. So now let's add another thing. Let's say source one uh, aperture. Did I spell that right? Scale t from negative 1 to 1 to be from 10 to 360. So when it goes, as it goes higher in the room, it will also get more reverberant. I think. Uh, 
Ah, I've turned the Omni all the way down. I'm just going to set these values to their defaults by double clicking on them. See here, now it's. Uh, indeed, yep. So this is a pretty simple example, but hopefully illustrates some of the the um, the power of of having a, an expression language like this, where you have a single value that's coming in, and we're already mapping that to three parameters very quickly. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Thank you, guys.